Welcome back to Basic Introduction to Deep Learning. In the first part of this course, we looked at key components of machine learning in the context of linear models. In this part, we are going to try and take what we saw in linear models and use that to allow us to understand neural networks. To start off, the question might come up, well, why would we want to use neural networks at all? What's wrong? with using linear models all the time. And this really comes back to the first key component that we looked at, which is data. And not all data can be well described using a line. In this case, we have some classic regression data and it looks more like a parabola than it does a line. We can also encounter issues when we try to do classification, because here it doesn't look like we can ever find a line that is going to allow us to separate the blue points from the red points. So how do we do this? What sort of model might we use to model this sort of data? One way to look at how we might use a model is to find a nonlinear transformation of X and then we can use that nonlinear transformation to give us an input to a linear model. For example, let's look at our example for regression. What we could do is we could do a parabolic transformation of x. And we see this by saying, OK, we take x, we minus the value, and we square it. Then we can use the output of this to the input to a linear model. That is, we take the output, we multiply it by a weight, and add a bias. For the classification example that we looked at, we can do a circular transformation. We take our data, transform it into a form where we are creating a circle, and then apply a linear model to that. In this case, we'll apply a logistic regression model, which means that we're going to take the input, we're going to apply a nonlinear transformation, we're going to apply a linear transformation, and then we're going to push that through a sigmoid. So what this is going to do is this will say, OK, points that are inside the circle will be blue, points outside the circle will be red. Now, it may not always be this easy to find what nonlinear transformation we need to apply to our data to make it so that we can then apply our, a linear model and get a reasonable result. This is where neural networks come in. So in the linear models, we had our parameters or weights. We just applied those to the inputs, and then we got our prediction. However, we were talking about wanting to not have the weights that lead to our prediction be directly tied to our inputs. We were talking about how we wanted to have some sort of transformation in between our inputs and our predictions. In neural networks, this is done by having our inputs, then applying a nonlinear transformation to our inputs to create hidden layer values. Then we will have those hidden layer values become the inputs to a linear predictor. Each one of these units in the hidden layer or artificial neurons in the hidden layer is calculated by doing a weighted sum of our inputs and then applying a nonlinearity. This nonlinearity is key because it's, it is what allows us to find nonlinear transformations of our inputs. Just the word nonlinearity may be a bit vague to sort of give you a more concrete uh, idea of what we're talking about with nonlinearities. Let's look at some of the common nonlinearities used in deep learning. Probably the most common nonlinearity in deep learning right now is something called a rectified linear unit, or RELU. And this just takes the weighted sum that we're getting from our inputs and our weights that are tied from our inputs to our hidden layer, 
And then says if that weighted sum is less than zero, we set the value of the hidden unit to zero. If it is greater than zero or equal to zero, then we just let whatever the weighted sum value is pass through and become the hidden unit value or hidden unit activation value. Another common nonlinearity is something that we've already seen, which is the sigmoid, which is just going to take the weighted sum that's coming into a hidden unit and then squash it to be between 0 and 1. The third nonlinearity that we're going to look at is called the hyperbolic tangent, or tan h. And it's just going to take our input and squash it to be between negative 1 and 1. Now, we're going to have a lot of different units in our hidden layer. And each one of these units is going to have a weight that corresponds to one of the input dimensions. And so we're just going to have weights for each one of the units in our hidden layer. And ultimately, we will have all of those weights be sort of the parameters for going from our inputs to our hidden layer. And this is going to be sort of our nonlinear transformation of our inputs. Then, as we said, once we have this nonlinear transformation, we're just going to apply a linear model or a linear predictor. And in this case, what we're going to have is for each unit in the hidden layer, we're going to have a weight that goes from that activation value to our predictor. In this case, in for linear regression, it will just go to become the prediction for our regression model. You can see that what we're doing is we're just making the same type of prediction that we did in linear regression, in that we're just predicting a real value that we hope to be close to the true output for a particular input. This means that we can use the same objective function, the same loss, when doing neural network regression it, as we did when we were doing linear regression. Now, you can also use neural networks in the context of binary regression, where instead of having your logit be a weighted sum of your inputs, you have the logit be the weighted sum of the activation values for your hidden units. Okay, so now we sort of have an idea of what's going on. And here again, what we can see is that since the prediction of our binary classification neural network is the sort of the same prediction that we saw in logistic regression, we can use a similar loss. Now that we have looked at the data, the models, and the objective functions, we can say, okay, well then how are we going to find the parameters of these neural networks that lead to good outputs? So we can return to looking at learning algorithms. As we talked about when we were looking at linear models, gradient descent is the most common training method for neural networks. However, what you'll often hear about when dealing with gradient descent and neural networks is something called backpropagation. And this is just applying the chain rule in such a way that allows us to compute the gradients for parameters throughout a neural network. To start off, we might say, okay, so we're going to have two groups of weights. Group one, which is going to go from our inputs to our hidden layer units and group two, which is going to go from our hidden layer units to our, in this case, our regression prediction. Well, how would we find how changing one of our group two weights would change our prediction? And this is very similar to when we looked at the chain rule for a linear model, where we say, okay, well, we want to know how does changing our prediction change our loss. Then how does changing our parameter change our prediction? In this case, what's going to happen is how our parameter changes our prediction is not going to be the input dimension value. It's going to be the corresponding hidden unit activation value. 
Now that we've sort of seen how we can find the, the gradients for group two, how can we find the gradients for group one? Well, we can say, okay, we know that going from an input dimension to a hidden unit is defined by this parameter. Then that how this parameter affects our prediction has to go through not only the input multiplication, like we saw in linear regression, it also has to go through this hidden unit. And so what this means is that we can just apply the chain rule where we have to say, okay, how does changing our prediction change our loss? How does changing the activation value of our hidden unit change our prediction? Then how does changing our parameter change the activation value of that hidden unit? And it's just another application of the chain rule. So far, what we looked at is we just looked at neural networks with one hidden layer, that is shallow neural networks. However, deep learning is about using deep neural networks. So what exactly are those? In deep neural networks, what you have is you have multiple hidden layers. And so the first hidden layer is going to take the input, the actual true input to our model as input. And then the other successive hidden layers are going to take the previous hidden layers activation values as input. And you're just going to apply as many hidden layers as you sort of want in your model sequentially. And then after the last hidden layer, you're just going to use those activation values as an input to a linear predictor. And in the case of a regression, that linear predictor will give you the regression prediction for the model. And in the case of binary classification, that linear component will give you the logit. And then that logit will be pushed through a sigmoid to give you the probability of y equaling 1. So now that we have these sorts of models, we are seeing that the predictions that we are making are the same predictions that we saw for the shallow neural networks that we saw for linear models. So we can use the same objective functions, which leaves us just say, okay, well, how do we find the right parameters of these deep neural networks? And so well, we're gonna return to learn algorithms. And in this case, to sort of give you an idea of how you could, ex how you could use backpropagation and gradient descent, for deep neural networks, we're just gonna look at a two layer neural network. And with that two layer neural network, we're gonna have three groups of weights or three groups of parameters. We're gonna have parameters that go from our inputs to our first hidden layer, that's group one. We're gonna have group two, which goes from our hidden layer one activation values to our second hidden layer. And then we're going to have group three, which goes from the activation values of our second hidden layer to our regression prediction. As we said before, we can sort of break down each one of these groups and say, how would we calculate how changing a parameter in that group would change our loss? So for a parameter in group three, this is going to be very similar to what we saw in the shallow neural network. And for a parameter in group two, it's going to be, again, it's similar to what we saw with the shallow neural network, where you're just going to say, OK, how does changing this parameter change a hidden unit? And then how does changing that hidden unit activation change my prediction? And then how does changing that prediction change the loss? Things get a little more complicated when we say, how, when we ask, how does changing a parameter in group one, that is a parameter that goes from our input to our first hidden layer, change our loss? Because changing that parameter will change the first layer hidden unit activation value associated with that parameter. Then changing that value will actually lead to changes for all of the second layer 
units. Then each one of those changes will potentially change our prediction. So what you have to do is you have to say, OK, well, we know how changing our prediction changes our loss. But then we have to sum up over how does changing our parameter change the second layer activation value? And then how does changing that activation value change our prediction? And so this is basically just saying that each change that we do needs to be added together to give us the total change that is going to happen if we change our group one parameter. Then we just have to say, OK, well, then how does changing our group one parameter change a activation value for a second hidden layer unit? We can just do that using the chain rule. Because changing our group one weight will just change the activation value of one of the hidden layer one units, then that change will affect the hidden layer two unit. And so what you can do is you can just sum together all these changes to get the total change. And so this sort of concept can be scaled to extremely large neural networks. And when you hear back propagation, these are the sorts of ideas that are being used. Then once you actually have all these gradients or how changing each parameter changes your loss, you can then just do gradient ascent like we looked at before. So to sort of recap, what we looked at is we looked at that some data is not easily modeled using a line. And so you may want to use some sort of neural or some sort of neural network that allows you to, to have a nonlinear model. These nonlinear models are still making the same sort of predictions that we saw when we were looking at linear models. And so you can use the same objective functions that you use in the linear models for these neural network models. Then we looked at how you can scale gradient descent to, to these sort of more complex models using backpropagation. In the third part of this course, we're going to take all of this and then apply it to a specific type of neural network called a convolutional neural network, which is really useful in some data regimes where you have regularly structured data.